Hey, man. Hi, my name is Matt, Ranger Matt, and welcome to another day with Slick, a better you. Over the last three years, I've had the pleasure of meeting many different people, book authors, pastors, singers, motivational speakers, people from television, people from the daytime serial world, and people from Disney. Why am I asking you this? I already know this. You're from where I'm at. Welcome more native. <laughs> Over these three years, I've heard many excellent stories. I've had many wonderful conversations, good laughs, and I've always enjoyed hearing stories from people in terms of how they got from point A to point B to where they are today. I've had a blast doing this, and I can't wait to see what else is in store. So sit back, relax, and here's a new episode of Slick, A Better You. Yeah, what are you gonna do? You know, that's a it's a messed up family. I guess my Ranger senses wasn't clicking in. Hi, how are everybody's doing today? This is your boy Ranger Matt. I am thrilled today to have another special guest on. This is my second guest of 2023. Um, I will have another guest or two that's going to be making it arrival between now and next month so i'm happy about that hope everybody's doing well i hope it's not snowing because i know in some place they're talking about it was snowing you know but i'm ready for that warm weather to kick in you know we we rangers we ride in the heat of the valley of horses so we need the warm to kick in so but uh anyway um i'm glad that you guys are here i'm glad my guest is here uh this gentleman has done a lot of directing and, and projects but one project particularly he done i got a clip here was something that was a part of everybody's childhood, including mine. <laughs> I was a big geek on it back in the 90s, and I got a clip of it. And this is what this is something that he did. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Shea Snob, I'd like to invite you to sing along with one of the all-time great musical masterpieces. Maestro. Well, amber drops and gum drops, so oh, what a rain that would be. What's he doing up there? Standing outside with my mouth open wide. Ah, 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 That's right. He was the director on Barney's Great Adventure. You know, for many people that know, Barney was a, a treasury in our childhoods. Um, so. Without further ado, let me bring him on, the man himself, who will be our next mayor in town. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steve Gomer himself. Hi, Steve. Hey, Matt. Good <laughs> to be with you. Hey, you know, I'm glad you're here, you know. Well, my pleasure. Who is, is that film, the gene, the, the poster behind you? That's, I'm just looking at that poster that's behind you. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a uh, great French film. Mm. Uh, by directed by Jean Renoir. Okay, uh, it, it's one of my favorites. It was that was a gift from my son. That poster, <laughs> so, right? It's always fun and stuff. So anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, is this no one where you at? Well, you, I no, know I'm you. In, you yeah. know, I'm in New York, and it's uh, it's like in the 40s. It's not bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like it might snow, but I don't think it will. But who knows? Right. Yeah. Okay. In Baltimore, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so how like when you was like when did you know that getting into the filmmaking business was something you wanted to do? Uh I, I'd always loved film. Um I I initially when I got out of high school thought I wanted to be an actor. Right. So uh I asked George Washington University. Um, but I transferred after my master and um, applied to the State University of New York College at Purchase, which was um, it was the last last state school that the governor at the time, Nelson Rockefeller, built. And it was really a great idea. Was, he said, look, you know, we're, Purchase is a very tiny town uh, that's about, you know, I'm not even it's maybe 25 miles outside of New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so Rockefeller said, 
for the state university system, you know, we should have a school for the arts and we'll pull people from the professionals who are working in New York will come up, you know, and teach. Right. And so I, I didn't apply to the concern. They had an acting conservatory. I didn't apply to that partly because I thought I wouldn't get in. I was afraid of that. And partly because I, I didn't want to just focus. I mean, I, I kind of thought I wanted to be an actor, but I wasn't sure. So I thought I should go into the liberal arts and study that stuff. And I figured at purchase, there would be classes I could take, you know, that were in the liberal arts. I didn't do a lot of research. And so by the, when I got to purchase, there were no classes offered in the liberal <laughs> arts, in the BA program. Right. Uh, there was one class that first semester that I was there, which was a continuing ed class taught by the guy who was going to be the teacher of the third class. When I went there, it was the first year of the conservatory. It was the first year of the school. Right. So the, the idea at the time was that one teacher would take each acting class through the four years. And then it was, you know, very, uh, you know, sort of a classical program, uh, pretty much based on Juilliard. So it was acting five days a week, uh, speech twice a week, voice twice a week, ballet, you know, sword fighting, fencing. I mean, it was like it pretty makeup, the whole thing for the theater. What really was based towards the theater. Right. So when I got there, the only class that was available was, as I say, a continuing ed class taught by the guy who was going to take the third group of students in. This guy named George Morrison. He was mm. an original member of Second City. So okay. He was teaching a continuing ed class uh, on theater games, which is, you know, what all the improvisational stuff is based on. It, right. Of games. So um, I took that class. It was me. Another a film student actually who I knew a little bit, and uh, about a dozen middle aged women. Mm. So you know, because it was a continuing ed class. Right. So I took the class. Um, I w always felt like I was pretty awkward as an actor, uh, and to I hit it off with George, and you know we would talk during the semester, different things, and mm -hmm. towards the end of the semester, he said to me. Um, he said, you know, I'm pretty sure you're not an actor. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm, he said, I'm pretty positive. He said, but I think you might be a director. He said, there's something about you that reminds me of me when I was your age. He said, are you interested in directing at all? Right. I said, well, I never directed, so I don't know. And he said, well, why don't you direct something? And I had gone, I, I'm from Yonkers, New York. So Yonkers was, you know, maybe 15 minutes from purchase. So he said, look, uh, th there was... At Purchase, there used to be a winter, a special winter program. It was a four-week program where you had to take a class five days a week, one yeah. class, right, and then write a big paper. And I didn't want to write a paper. <laughs> so he said, well, you know, the, the all, alter, alternative uh, you can do is um, you can do a project. So he said, why don't you get in touch with your principal at school? I'll give you a letter that, it, you know, it's sanctioned by purchase and um, see if they'll let you direct a play over right. these four weeks. And then at the end of the four weeks, uh, the dean and I will come and look at it and see if, you know, you, you you're, and see if you like it and see if we like it, you know. So I did a I did a production of um, I did a production of the Fantastics with a friend of mine who was a musician he did the music and we did it and I, and I actually really enjoyed it and George came with the dean who was Norris Houghton who was really you know very well known guy he had run a number of theaters like from the 1940s you know and um right and they liked it they and they said okay look we were planning on having a directing program later but if you don't mind being the guinea pig we'll bring you into the conservatory and set up the program for you and we'll see how it goes. So I said, okay, you know, cause I, I did enjoy it. I mm -hmm. felt really comfortable. I mean, I actually felt very alive in a way, you know, it was right. re really something. So, so they put me into the conservatory uh, and then they, they were great. Cause then they said, all right, you, you'll take the acting program for two years, mm -hmm. full acting program. And in the at the same time, 
I would meet with George and just, he'd give me readings and we would discuss them. I would write stuff about those. I had to take liberal arts classes mm -hmm. as well. And, um, and then, you know, after the first year, they started allowing me to, to start directing with the students. Uh, they didn't want me to like, you know, infect them at the beginning if I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I started directing scenes and then short, you know, one act plays. Uh, and then, uh, then a final, you know, big production. Um, and I did a production of The Queer Fellow by Brendan Behan, which is a really wonderful play. Right. And that turned out well. And, um, and then, you know, then I was talking to George and saying, okay, now what? You know, like, what do I do? And he said, uh, he said, look, it was, he was great. He said, um, look, you, you could go to Yale. Mm -hmm. And it's a two year program. At the, I think it was two years at that time. He said, it's like 35,000 a year. You come out, you'll be 70,000 in debt or maybe a hundred, you know, cause you have to live as well. That's just tuition. Right. He said, but, and then when you finish that program, you'll have to go to New York and look for work. He said, or you could consider yourself 70 grand ahead now and go to New York and look for work. <laughs> you don't have any debt and you know you don't have to make a lot of money he said i know you you know you're from yonkers you can live home for a while mm -hmm. so he said why don't you write letters to the different theaters in in the city and just tell them you know what you've been doing and that you just want to learn and be you know you just want to be there so um i wrote letters to all the resident companies in new york got positive responses from the public theater and the uh circle repertory company and the circle rep at that time was, um, I think it was about three or four years old, but it had been doing some great work. It was Lanford Wilson's theater. So, right. you know, they had some good plays. They were, they, they had already done uh, Hot L Baltimore and that mm. was a big hit. And then, you know, they did six shows a year, six plays a year with a repertory company. Wow. And, um, and, and George said, well, if you go to the public theater, he said, they're pretty bureaucratic already. They'll probably put you in the casting department and it'd be pretty hard to break out of that. If you go to the circle, you know, since it's new and it's like less formal, uh, you'll be able to explore different parts of the production. You'll learn more, he thought. So that's what I did. And, I, you know, the first few months it was just to get, um, I said, all I asked for was, you know, like car fare, you know, for the subway. And, um, right. and then about three or four months into the time that I was there, uh, there was a, they, Marshall Mason, who was the artistic director, fired the guy who was the production coordinator, who was essentially the producer at mm. the theater. And um, I, I didn't get along with the guy. And I, I, I had told him, I was hanging lights in the, in the theater one day and he came in and he started bugging me. And I just said, go fuck yourself. You know, I don't really want to, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I'm, you're not paying me. I'm working my ass off, you know, uh, get off my back. You know, just let me do the work. Right. <laughs> anyway, then, um, and I figured, okay, that's it. They're going to fire me, you know? And, um, you know, he likes warm, warm. And then Marshall came over to the theater. We, we had like our offices were in the theater was on 7th Avenue South. It was like a block apart. Right. He came over and he hardly ever came over to the theater before before the company moved into the theater for the show. You know, we had a rehearsal room up in the offices. Right. So it was unusual for him to come over. And I figured he's coming over to, you know, fire me. And he says, hey, Steve, you know, let, let's go to lunch. So I figured, OK, he's like letting me down easy. And we go to lunch and he says, look, I just fired that guy and I want you to take his job. So um, I look at him and I said, and I can't believe I said this, but it's like, you know, in my mind, it's embedded in my mind. And I said, you know, Marshall, I, I'm really learning a lot doing what I'm doing now. I'm, I don't know if I want to do that. And he just looked at me, looked across the table and he goes, what are you, a schmuck? He said, I'm offering you a great job. You just got out of college. Oh. So I did that job and then they, you know, and they let me, you know, put in for, you know, for some money. Cause I, since I, I had just gotten out of school and, saw that you know how hard it was to get started so i applied for a grant and it, that allowed us to bring in interns um then i ordered i got another grant that allowed us to do workshop productions at another theater so it was a successful thing and i did that for a few years and then i got an offer to work with a guy named joe chaikin who was 
kind of the leading avant-garde the, uh, avant-garde director in mm. New York at the time. He had a company called the Open Theater, and I had always really admired their work. So, um, you know, I went to Marshall, and and he he knew Joe, and I said, "Look, this has been great, but I, you know." I feel like this is an opportunity I don't want to pass up, even though I've been directing already. But, you know, I, I wanted to work with this guy. So I went to work with him as his assistant, his right. assistant director. And then we did a, a bunch of productions in the city. And then I, I redirected one in Paris. We did a production of Endgame. Uh, you know, so I worked with Joe for about five or six years. We did a production of Dybbuk at the public theater, which was a big hit. And, um, and then I, I felt like I wanted to do a documentary about him. A lot of people had approached him about doing documentaries, but he didn't know them. So he was mistrustful of it. Mm -hmm. When I approached him, you know, I mean, we, you know, we'd been working together for five years, so he trusted me and he said, yeah, okay. And he was just about to uh, start a production to, to develop a, a production with Sam Shepard. So, so anyway, so, you know, I, I contacted a friend of mine from Purchase who was the best cinematographer in the film school when I was in the theater school. Right. And I said, you know, look, we don't have any money, but do you want to help me make this documentary? <laughs> and he said, yeah. So, um, we would, you know, we kept, we worked other jobs. I mean, I kept, I, I kept doing, I was like an NBC page for a while. Uh, you know, I directed a couple of things. I mean, just to make some money, you know, and every time we got like a few thousand dollars, right. go down to, you know, fourth Avenue downtown, which is where Kodak was at the time. And we would buy, you know, a certain amount of 16 millimeter film. John Heller, who was the DP, he had a camera. Mm. So then we would go and we would call Joe and I would say, hey, we got some money, we can shoot. And Joe <laughs> understood the process because, you know, he never made a lot of money and he always had to raise money to do his production. Right. So, um, and then, you know, so we would, we would shoot whatever, you know, he was rehearsing or working with other people or we did interviews with other people he had worked with. Uh, and then we would take the film and we wouldn't process it. We would just put it in the freezer. I mean, so both of our freezers by the end were full of film, no, not food. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, and then by the time, I don't know how, then I, then I started raising money, you know, like talking to friends and family. And, and when, when I thought we had enough money to, we had, we knew we had enough film now. Right. So then we could go to an editor. I didn't want to start and stop with an editor. So we didn't work, start working at editing it. Anyway, then we, you know, we had enough money. We had, we went out to California to shoot Shepard on some other, you know, for part of the film. But, you know, and anyway, so we finished the film. Uh, we edited it and it got, you know, really good reviews and got a theatrical distribution, which we had never planned, really. Right. And then, uh, but it gave me, I didn't know anything about filmmaking. You know, I mean, I learned on the job and John helped me a lot. I had watched, right. I'd always been a really big fan of movies, foreign films, old films. And when I was at school, luckily, I mean, things turned out, it's like, it was weird fate in, in a certain way. Because when I was at school at GW that first year, um, I don't know, for whatever reason, the classes were very easy. I, I didn't really have to work very hard. And across the street from my dorm was, were, were, was a theater that had two screens. And right. every day, it, you know, it was, it, was a, um, it was like a repertory film theater. So every day um, they would have a double feature on each screen mm -hmm. of foreign films. Films. So... I would go pretty much every afternoon, you know, when I was done with my classes and see a double feature. So by the time, the end of the year, I had seen a ton of, you know, John Ford, Howard Hawks, Renoir, uh, Kurosawa. I mean, I really opened up my mind to all of that stuff and I loved it. Right. So uh, after the Chaikin film, 
Uh, there was a picture I wanted to make about the last year of a kosher hotel in the Catskills. And that hmm. was called Sweet Lorraine. And, and um, my wife was working as a physical therapist at the time. So she was supporting us and gave me the, I mean, it was really, you know, wonderful of her. Right. But it gave me the time to, you know, raise money to get this. I, I'm not a writer. I like working with writers. So I hired a couple of writers, you know, we, and we just, um, but it took five years to raise the money for that. Mm -hmm. And that picked, but we were able, you know, we had great, you know, at the time that they, we're talking like 19, 85, 86 in New York. And there was a pretty strong independent film community. Right. So John Sales was kind of the head of it. And I had met John at a couple of events, met some of the other people, and, and John was very helpful. And he, um, he, 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 you know, this was after the script was written, obviously. And uh, I started showing it around to people. And mm -hmm. so then I was able to, you know, he, he gave like some of his people who he had worked with and, and recommended that they work with me, you know, if whenever I got this picture, you know, set up. Right. <laughs> so, um, we kind of, we, you know, we were able to raise the money, but well, we were, I mean, it was not, it, part, parts of it were nightmarish where money would be, committed and then it would never come through most people turn you down when you go out you know but I, my head was such that I, I knew it was going to be hard you know and i knew we were going to get rejected mostly mm -hmm. and you know for whatever reason i just felt like well we just need to find one person you know i mean we can get 99 no's and one yes and that's good right so it turned out it was joe sala who um made a lot of money in real estate hmm. and he was friends with um, Mer Ismail Merchant and Jim Ivory, you know, Merchant Ivory films. Right. And he had put money into their, one of their films. So he was kind of open to it. And mm -hmm. um, he really, he liked the script very much and he was a real deal maker, Joe, you know? So he said, okay, if you raise this much money, I'll I'll put in whatever you need to finish the film. And it, I think it was he said, if you can raise two fifty, I'll put in. And the budget that we had at the at that time was like one point two million, I think. Right. And um, so I don't think I ever quite raised it, but he saw that I was working hard, mm. and I think we raised about two hundred. So he, okay. he he said, okay, I'll do it, and. Um, you know, he, he just was, and then he got, you know, he called Ismail Merchant and Ismail came and helped, you know, you know, sat with me and talked with, you know, talked to me about filmmaking and stuff. And uh, John Sales's um, casting director, Barbara Shapiro, uh, agreed to be the casting director. And, and she was, she got us Maureen Stapleton because we needed a, a woman who, you know, who owns the hotel. Right. So, um, I think we made a deal with Maureen. I forget how much she got per week, but she would give us two weeks. So, you know, we worked our asses off. We hired a crew. Oh, you know, David Gropman, who's, who turned out to be a really brilliant, um, he's been nominated for a few Oscars, the production designer. I had worked with David in theater. So mm -hmm. when I said, when I called him and said, hey, I'm doing this film, we, you, you know, you feel like doing it. He said, yeah, okay. You know, I mean, the money was nothing for the, you know, it was like very low. Right. I, I wasn't in the union at that time. I don't think it wasn't a union picture. So we didn't have a union crew. We right. brought a, actually a lot of the crew in from Canada, you know. So um, anyway, so we, you know, we I think on that picture, I storyboarded the whole thing. I, I mean, I worked with a storyboard artist and we storyboarded every scene because I had never made a narrative feature. Right. So. You know, I really wanted to be like overly prepared. And um, Gary Marcus came on as the first AD. And Gary had done a couple of pictures already, a couple of good pictures. Mm -hmm. But Gary and I hit it off. And I, but it was funny. I mean, we did the whole thing on location. Right. We, we were able to work at the hotel. Mm -hmm. And um, my wife and I were living in a 
one of the bungalows that was on the grounds. And I remember Gary coming over the first morning, the fir- you know, first day of shooting. Right. To walk across this big field to, you know, where we were shooting the first scene, which was right at the entrance of the big, big hotel. And the hotel was built in 1905, and David did a beautiful job uh, renovating it, you know, and restoring it, really. And so it was very, really picturesque. And and the and I, I was really nervous, and I'm walking across the field with Gary, and I said to Gary, you know, Gary, I said, I just realized I've never been on a movie set before. And uh, so, like, where do I stand? Because when we did the documentary, I was doing the interviews, you know. Right. So I said, you know, I, I don't know where to stand. Like, what, what do I do? And he said, um, he goes, look, he goes, if you stand right next to camera, you'll never get in the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, oh, that, yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, I started just standing next to camera. I mean, even though, oh, that was the other thing was that I didn't want anybody on that crew who was who was learning on the job. Every I wanted everybody. I wanted to be the least experienced person. Right. And also at that time, uh, video assist was just coming out, but it wasn't part of the camera package. So Mm -hmm. you had to pay extra for it. And my attitude was, look, you know, all these great pictures, which I had seen, you know, by Ford and Hawks and Hitchcock, whoever they didn't use. You know, the only person that I knew of who used video assist was Jerry Lewis, you know, Mm. who, who actually invented it. You know? Right. So that he could see himself, you know, he could like do playback. And and I, my attitude was, well, all these great pictures were made without it. So I don't want to spend the money because, you know, we really had, you know, we very little money. So, um, I mean, even though, look, I'm very aware that a million dollars is a lot of money, but mm-hmm. not for a movie, you know. <laughs> um, so anyhow, um so, you know, that was it. So, I mean, you know, I did that picture and it, you know, again, we got good reviews and it won a big award at the Tokyo Film Festival. Um, it, I mean, it won the award that year. And I, I was really surprised that it got invited to Tokyo, first of all. Mm. And that was partly Joe, you know, I mean, because I took I took hardly any money to make that picture. Right. I mean, as a salary, you know, I put it all into the picture. Mm-hmm. And that was the only, the Tokyo Film Festival that year was the only film festival that was giving out a cash prize. If you wow. want, so Joe, <laughs> I mean, only if you want. So, so Joe said, you know, um, he said, I, I think you, I think we should go there because if you win, you you know you'll make some money. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so we you know luckily we got picked, we got selected, you know, to go. Mm-hmm. And the Tokyo Film was really nice. Gregory Peck was the uh, he was the chairman of the jury, um, and Claude Berry, a really great French director, was on the jury. Uh, I forget there was a really great Japanese. Oh, the guy who directed um, either directed. I never could figure out if he directed or produced Godzilla, but every time you'd meet this guy, you know, he couldn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Japanese, but he would go, Godzilla, Godzilla. And he'd go, Godzilla. So, so I know he either directed or produced it, but I, I never figured out what he did. Right. But anyway, um, and Alan and Marilyn Bergman were on, they were on the jury. I mean, the jury was really an interesting jury, but I, my attitude was, look, we're never going to win here. I mean, there's some really, you know, it's really good filmmakers here. Um, so it was pretty shocking when we did. Um, and it came, you know, with a, I forget what it was. It was like 10 million yen mm-hmm. fries. Which at the time <laughs> was like, was a hundred thousand dollars. So we're talking like mid eighties. Right. But to me, it was like a fortune of money. I mean, m- much more money than, and I never made that much money again for quite a while. But, right. Uh, but anyway, so that turned out well. And then when it won, you know, then we, I started getting uh, invited to go out to L.A. for I never intended to move to L.A., but I, you know, L.A. is always people are always looking for like the new thing, you know. Right. So when they heard that I won and, you know, also Gregory Peck talked about me to people and Alan and Marilyn Bergman talked about, you know, so I got called out to do 
meetings. I mean, most of them were, you know, bullshit, really. You know, they, nothing comes of them, but, you know, they're good. You got to do them. And, um, but then, then I, so I was looking around for my next project. I mean, nobody was offering me a job. They were all just wanted to talk to me. Right. And um, so I came back, you know, I would go out and do the, but anyway, then I was looking around in New York for my next picture. And um, that turned out to be Fly By Night, which we made in 90, I don't know, 92. And that was an er one of the early pictures about the rap world in New York. Wow. And so I never uh, seen it. Uh, nobody's seen it because it, um, we made it. I, I went to KRS one, you know, Chris Parker to, to see if he was interested in helping on it. And he was, which was great. And, um, we had a great script, uh, by Todd Graff. It was his first script. I mean, he's gone on to write, you know, a bunch of great stuff. Um, Anyway, we did that picture and that picture got invited to Sundance and that one at Sundance in 93. Okay. So then I started getting offers. So then Jane and I, my, my wife, and uh, we had a daughter by that time, Sarah, we all moved out to LA thinking it was just going to be a short time, like a lot of people think, and then turned out to be, you know, 25 years. Right. So that's anyway, that's what I think of as the beginning of something. I don't I don't know. Did that answer? No, I, it, anyway. it, it did. <laughs> I, I got you. I got your full bio. Never okay. going to do a doc about your life. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's how I started out. Right. So how did um, well, I'm going to ask, how did you um, how did the project come to you about the Barney movie, Barney. Great Adventure? Did you did you know about the show? I mean, how, how did that come yeah. about for you? Well, it was pretty that was pretty funny in a way, because. Um, but, you know, especially when we my daughter was when we moved out to L.A., my daughter was four mm -hmm. and Barney was on TV already. And when we were in New York, so she used to watch Barney every day. Right. And. You know, we we heard from friends who also had kids like similar age and they would say, oh, have you seen this horrible thing? Barney, this, you know, and, I, and Jane and I were like, we don't it was like our attitude was, you know. The, the kid, you know, whatever, whoever your kid is, the kid's going to learn soon enough that the world can be miserable, <laughs> you know, right. So why when, you know, Barney, the, the target age for Barney is two to five. You know, it's, it's even younger than, you know, it's like kind of younger than Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really for young kids. And our attitude was, what's the problem here? I mean, it's just this creature who loves everybody. And he's got these other two creatures that, you know, are with him. And then there's a bunch of bad kid actors. And but they're all, you know, like they're all talking about, you know, loving everybody. I, so it was like our attitude was what's the problem here? I mean, the kid's going to learn soon enough that, right. you know, there's going to be some miserable times. But, <laughs> why Why do you want to push that on somebody? You want to take them out when they're three and, and look around and say, this is awful. And, you know, it's like, what's the problem? So right. the, the reason, they, the way they got to me was that, there, you know, there's people in LA who sort of, um, they never... They never actually work on a picture, but they sort of ingratiate themselves to, to different producers and stuff. And, you know, they might get a credit on a movie. Anyhow, there was one of those guys who had seen the movie, who had seen Fly By Night at right. Sundance. Mm -hmm. The guy who was the Sundance, Sundance at that time had a, a low, low, low budget division. Wow. And um, they, in fact, they, they were the ones who produced Sex, Lies, and Videotape, mm -hmm. this low-budget division of Sony. So the guy who was the um, head of that, he really liked the script for Fly By Night. So he, they, they had ups and downs. So he said he wanted to do it. Then they went, then they kind of suspended work for a while and then they came back and, and he was as good as his word because when they came he said look we're going down for a while we're going to figure things out but i really want to make this picture so they put i had raised some money but they put in the majority of the money right and the deal was that they own the picture 
Mm -hmm. you know, whoever puts the money in generally owns it. So we did the picture. Um, we had to work really hard on the picture to not get an NC-17 rating. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think it, I don't think there's more than two or three lines. You know, this was early days of rap. So I, I don't think there's more than two or three lines that, that go by without someone calling somebody a motherfucker. You know, it's <laughs> like, I mean, it's just, you, you, you're right. And I had to, you know, my attitude whenever I do anything is I want it to be honest, you know, so, you know, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't do this thing of like a lot of white guys where they meeting with black guys, they're like, they pretend to be hip or, you know, black kind of, and my attitude was, look, I'm a white guy, you know, I'm this white <laughs> Jewish guy, and, but I'm really fascinated by this world. And so when we started making the picture, I mean, Todd did a great job on the script mm -hmm. and he, I mean, he's a white guy too, but what I said to everybody who we cast was, look, you can change any line you want. Just make it honest, you know, so you see how it's written. But if it does not, not making sense or it's not what you would say, change it. Right. You know, we got and if there's behavior that we've we haven't gotten right, change it. You know, we'll, let's let's collaborate. I mean, that's kind of been my watchword of all the work I've done is is collaboration. Mm -hmm. So. The thing was, the guy who was the head of Sony at that time, of, bi of big Sony, not the little, you know, low budget division, literally was an accountant. I mean, at that point, he was, an, he was, people always make fun of those executives and they say, oh, he's an accountant. This guy was an accountant. Right. And he hated rap. And, and I don't know if you must remember this, Matt, you know, like at that time, you know, the early 90s, there was still a question about, is rap a flash in the pan? Is it going to stick around? Is, you know, is it going to go away? You know what I mean? It hadn't taken over the culture yet. Right. And his this guy's attitude is, he, I mean, and he was very out, uh, upfront about it. He said, look, he goes, I don't care that you wanted Sundance. He goes, I hate this movie. <laughs> I hate everything about this movie. Dang. <laughs> the audience is going to hate the movie. So I'm not releasing it. And uh, we'll just go straight to video. And uh, October Films was starting at that time. Mm -hmm. And they called me, the, the two guys from October, uh, and said, can, you know, can we have lunch? And I was like, yeah, of course. And they said, we really want this film. We, we, we want this to be our first film that we'll release. So I said, look, I'd love that. But you got to talk to this guy because he's adamant about not releasing the picture. Right. And so they negotiated with him for about seven months. Because, you know, if you, if someone else produces a picture and you release it, uh, you generally have to give some percentage of what you take in theatrically to that person, you know, right? And to, to that entity. Um, so it, it started off at like maybe 18 or 20 percent. And then they finally got it down to like 5 percent. Then this guy wouldn't do it. I mean, they were, they hard, you know what I mean? It was like. I mean, five percent was. I don't know. It worked out where they, they were hardly going to make any money on this. Mm -hmm. His attitude was, and he told me, he said, "Look, if I release this picture, they're going to have to, you know, promote it, and, uh, you know, so they're going to be spending money that I'm going to, you know, that's going to be taken out of my profit. I mean, it was like a whole thing. It was all a bit to do with profit. Right. He said, if I go to, uh, he goes, if I if I go straight to video." I know how much I'm I'm losing. Mm -hmm. He said, "I don't want to lose any more money on this thing." So there was so no one has seen the picture, but the, some of the people at the studio saw it. Right. So that's so I got a call from Danny DeVito's company from Jersey Films mm -hmm. to come in and talk to them about you know doing a picture, which eventually turned out to be Sunset Park, um, and you know which was all, another anyway. Getting back to to Barney. <laughs> so the guy, this this kind of hanger on guy, had glommed on to Cheryl Leach and the people at Barney because mm -hmm. everybody at that point, every studio wanted to make a Barney movie, every studio. And what they were looking for was a um, a director who had done music a musical. But you know, you remember in the you know early nineties, you know like or mid 90s 
I mean, no one had made a musical for like 20 or 25 years, you know? Right. But this guy who had seen Fly By Night at Sundance, he conv- he said, oh, Steve just directed a musical. <laughs> you should talk to him. And I'm thinking, these people do not know what, you know, it's like Barney. Is this, and this is like all the way over here. Right. But um, I think Cheryl, I think Cheryl saw the picture. I'm not even sure. But I think she did, and she liked it, and she understood that, okay, this is not the music we're going to be using but um, for Barney. But, you know, we hit it off, and I mean, the way I looked at Barney was I said, look, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, The Wizard of Oz. I mean, it's a bunch of guys in suits, you know, uh, so what's, you know, and it's got music. What's the difference, you know? Let's do it. And, and they liked my take on it. They, I mean, I think they liked that I compared it to the, to the Wizard of Oz. Right. But they gave me a lot of freedom on it. And I, you know, they had a script already, which was like the, I think the first script they had was 300 pages. And, you know, a a feature script should be about 110. Right. Um, So it was really way overwritten. And, and they said, look, we know, we know we got to do some work on the script. Um, And I said, well, one thing I, I would recommend is that there be a character in the picture, a lead character who hates Barney because. So it was your idea. Okay. <laughs> no, no, well, I'll tell you why. No, no, it was really for, you know, I mean, cause I knew that there was a bunch of adults and, and I, I, friends of ours, sometimes what they would do is they said, well, they would let our kids watch Barney, mm-hmm. but we would leave the room. You know, we'd go and do something else. We couldn't stand it. Right. And so my attitude was, well, you know, in a movie, you know, movie theater, you can't just, you're not going to leave a three-year-old sitting by him or herself right right so the adults are going to have to stay watch and watch this movie Mm -hmm. so i said i think we should have someone in the movie who they could these adults could identify with if they hate barney right oh yeah this kid hates barney too you know And and that turned out to be that's what the movie became about was this kid who you know, so they changed the script and this is about this kid who doesn't, you know, doesn't believe or doesn't believe in make believe or, you know, fantasy. Right. His sister and, and her friend do. And, you know, then they find this egg and, you know, then it's a chase. The whole movie's a chase. Right. You know, and, and they but they were great, you know, so we we scouted a few locations, but. Um, I really wanted to work in Montreal because, uh, well, they wanted to work in Canada. If, if possible, they wanted to work in Canada. Right. And I wanted to work in Montreal because there were two reasons. One was um, Cirque du Soleil was just starting. And I, and I was hopeful that we could uh, work with them and they would be the day players in the movie. Right. So that was one thing I wanted because there's a, there was a magical quality you know, about their work. Mm-hmm. And the other thing was uh, Montreal, Quebec is the only province that has its own um, movie community. You know, there's a separate union for those guys, you know, whereas the rest of Canada ki- kind of works with America mostly. And right. I, I wanted, I don't know, I just wanted that vibe, a different kind of vibe, you know, from these guys. Plus, Montreal is great because like 15 minutes at that time outside of Montreal you were in beautiful farmland mm-hmm. and you know, the, the, the starting lo- starting and ending location for that movie, you know, is a farm, you know, sort of an iconic farm that doesn't really exist, but you know, I, I knew we could, you know, turn it into something. Right. So, so, you know, and they agreed to that. They said, yeah, Montreal's great. Let's do it. Um, you know, they, they pretty much let me cast it. Um, I don't know what, oh yeah, and then we, what did we do? I forget what we did, you know, it's a long time ago now, so I don't remember now what we did in terms of the score. I think Richard, I had been working with Richard Robbins, Dick Robbins, who did all the music for Merchant and Ivory. Mm -hmm. And Dick did the music for Sweet Lorraine. He didn't do the music for Fly By Night because it was not his thing. And right. I think he did the music. I'm pretty sure Dick did the music for Barney as well. So that's how it came about. I mean, it was just this guy saying, oh, yeah, this guy did a musical, you know, so he can probably, you know, he can do this. <laughs> so that's what it was, you know. Mm. 
Was there a, um I know it's been some time, but I was gonna say, like, was there a favorite uh scene from the movie that stands out to you? Um let me think. Well, there's a couple of scenes I really like a lot. I like the scene, um I like the whole sequence where the guy's in his truck and he's making food in the <laughs> truck, you know, it's like and that was that was added. We, you know, we it was at that time was like the first time I was aware that, you know, these cars were being sold with a lot of, um, you know, coffee holders and stuff. It was like everybody was eating in their car. So I thought, let's do this, but take it to like as far as we can, you know. Right. So he has like an oven in there. He's got a stir. You know, I don't know what it's got a coffee machine, I think. I, I really love that. I think, you know, the, the production designer came up with some great ideas for that scene. I like it a lot. Right. And um, I like this, the circus scene. You know, there's there's one scene that where they're at like a where they're at a circus. Yeah. And that's all the Cirque du Soleil people, you know, so that was fun. Mm. But and we had a good time. And we had also they, you know, we had a lot of time on that. We had 65 shooting days. Um, I like the balloon sequence. That was all green screen. You know, I mean, it would be. That would look a lot different now with you know this CGI that exists now. This this was that took it that the balloon sequence took us about wow uh, two days to shoot. Right. No, no. What am I saying? Two weeks to shoot, and it's not a long sequence. But at that time to do green screen, um, it was very. It was you had to. It was very. You had to be very precise of like where the camera was, what the color temperature was of the green screen, what your, you know, it was like a whole thing. And you could pretty much just get like, you know, a minute a day. I mean, it was like not even, you know, it was very hard to do. Right. But, but everybody had a good time on that picture. And, you know, most of the crew was, you know, French Canadian. So they spoke French for the most part. Uh, but we, we had, a, you know, we had a good cast. The kids were great. Uh, we had to change the costume for Barney because the Barney suit on the show, the way they did the TV show um, was, um, you know, there's two different people. There's one person in the suit and one person speaking. Right. And what they did on the TV show was they had the guy in the suit, you know, and then the guy who spoke for him was off stage, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so, you know, off camera. And... The, ki the kids had to, you know, be like trained <laughs> not to look at the guy speak. And if you watch the show carefully, which I don't recommend, but if, if you do, you'll see every once in a while a kid will be, you know, doing this. Yeah, you know, I'm seeing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the thing when we knew going in that because... As I say, we were on location most of the time. So mm -hmm. he Barney'd be running with the kids or something. So they right. couldn't have the guy like running after them speaking, you know. So right. we we had the we had it was like a whole tricky thing. We had to put a speaker in Barney's, you know, like where Barney's nose would be, right? Mm -hmm. And we also, you know, we were we were we started the shoot in the summer, uh, outside Montreal, and it was very hot. You know, it was like in the 90s a lot of the days. Wow. And the guy in the suit, like after the day, day I, he might have passed out. I don't remember. If it was, something happened that was pretty serious. <laughs> and so we rigged up a uh, a fan. We, 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 we thought we could put an air conditioner in. We could, could, could create an air conditioner in, but we had a fan put in. Mm. You know, above, you know, could, he... he the guy in the suit looks through Barney's mouth. Right. I think. I mean, again, it's a long time ago, but I think he looks through his mouth. And um, so there's there's room above his head in, the, in that costume. So mm -hmm. we put in, we put a fan, we, we rigged up a fan that ran on batteries inside. Right. And that kept him sort of cool, you know, but we would have to, uh, we, we have to take frequent, frequent breaks to let him, you know, so he wouldn't, you know, just like, you know, sweat away. Uh, but he was a strong guy, that guy that was in the suit. Right. So it was a fun shoot, though. It was really fun. Mm. The thing was that was interesting was, and we got, you know, we also, we got pretty good reviews on that movie. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the reviews were like, 
to the effect of this movie is a lot better than it needs to be. <laughs> Something like that. It was pretty funny. Right. But the thing was the um the polygram guys uh they I, there was I guess it was you know we had that we had the opening of that movie at Rockefeller sent at not at Radio City. Right. You know at the music hall. And I, they they came up to me and they said, you know, we just realized the uh you know, the kids who are going to see this, they're, they're only, you know, they're going to be like two to five. And those kids don't pay for, for their tickets. They get in free. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, well, okay, <laughs> nothing I can do about that. Right. And so, you know, in terms of people who went to the theater to see the pictures a lot, but only like, you know, like one adult would bring like four kids, mm -hmm. you know? So anyhow, it was, you know, it turned out that, it made its money back finally, you know, mm -hmm. in, in video sales and stuff, but not theatrically. Right. Did you did your daughter like the movie? Yeah, she really liked it. Mm -hmm. I think. I mean, I you know, I think <laughs> so. I don't have to ask my wife, but I'm pretty sure she did. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so before we get back into your um career, um, well, we are talking about your career, I mean, <laughs> but um we we had mentioned this, so you know, recently they did the documentary about, you know, I Love You, You Hate Me, and yeah. you're, you're, you're in it. You're in the, I think you, you're you also in the beginning when they was asking people, will you say the I Love You song? You participated in that, and I thank you for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. How did they approach you about that? Uh, you... I think they got in touch. I think, I'm pretty sure they, I think they got in touch with my lawyer, mm -hmm. and who's out in L.A., and it, I was, I was, we were here. We Yeah, we were here here in you know new new jersey in jersey city um so they got in touch with my lawyer my lawyer called me and said you know you you want to talk to these guys and i said yeah yeah sure of course and the deal they they had gotten from peacock you know because polygram was bought by universal mm -hmm. and now universal and nbc are the same company uh, you know uh i don't know who bought who i don't know if universal bought nbc or if nbc bought universal but now they're the same Right. And Peacock. So Peacock has the um, has the rights to to the movie, to the Barney movie. Mm -hmm. um, and they agreed they were going to do a three hour, you know, um, movie. And I'm thinking like, wow, three hours on Barney. That's a lot. And it, it, as it turned out, so they, I went to do the interview with them. They were they had gotten a uh, space in Brooklyn and we did the interview. Uh, and they were really nice guys, really good guys. Um, and then they called me and said um, that the, the picture came, you know, they thought it turned out well, but Peacock realized that three hours was a lot of time for Barney. Mm -hmm. So they cut it back to two. So they were actually calling to apologize and saying, look, we had to cut out your interview because, you know, it's just, we just, we don't have time. So I, right. I said, guys, it's fine by me. Whatever, you know, it's like whatever you want to do is, I, I, you know, I mean, like I, once I make it, you know, I made it. So it's like, okay, you know, I don't, whatever, you know, it's fine by me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Um, it said that the last thing you, well, did you direct an, um, an episode or be a part of Heartland? Yeah. What was the experience like? Uh. Heartland was. Um, have you? Did you see it? Because we only did eight episodes. Uh, I mean, I've watched it here and there. I haven't fully seen the series, but I watched it a little bit to yeah. get an idea of what it's about. Um, it, yeah, I, I've seen it a little bit. I mean, oh, because there's the one that the one that I worked on was the one about um, organ transplant. Okay. Is that the one you're thinking of? There's another Heartland. I might have got. I think I got the two shows mixed up because yeah. the, I, the, the the ones the, I was thinking about the one that Jack Wagner was in. I think that's not. Yeah, no, no, he's in. No. He's in another one called uh, "When Heart Calls to Home." No, oh, no, that, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, that's like that's Michael Landon Jr. Didn't he direct, uh, produce, and direct that? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I know him. I know Michael, but I I I don't. I think I only I only saw one episode. He asked me to take a look at it, but um. No, the picture Heartland, the TV series Heartland that I worked on was about organ transplant. It was, uh, 
de created and developed and, and run by David Hollander, who did The Guardian, mm -hmm. which was one of the first TV shows that I did. And because um, after I made, after, where did I, let me, I'm trying to think of the order. Yeah, so Barney, Bar yeah, so Barney was the fourth feature that I did in about nine or 10 years. Right. But I, I felt at that time that I wasn't, I, I, I was aware of the stuff I didn't know, you know? And when you make a picture every like two, two and a half years, I, I felt like I was getting rusty in between each. And I really wanted to learn more. So I was in the uh, editing room with the editor on Barney. The guy who edited Barney was Richard Halsey. He won the yeah. Oscar for um, Rocky. Okay. And Richard and I became really good friends. Um, and we were taught, you know, we also, we, we shot Barney on film. Mm. So when you shoot on film, the editor, the director spends a lot more time in the editing room than that. You know, it's much faster editing now on digital. Right. Film, you know, if you, if you want to change something, you have to, you know, the assistant has to go in the other room and find the film, find the frames. You might be like a four frames that you've cut out. Now you need to restore. So you have a lot of time to hang out and talk. And I was talking to Richard and I said, you know, there's like interesting stuff on television and I'm kind of curious about it. So he said, um, he said, yeah, you should look into it. And he goes, I'll, I'll get in touch with my friend, this guy named Michael Pressman, who's he ran. Uh, he did the he's, he was doing pilots. So he did the pilot for um, Chicago Hope. And I forget he ran Picket Fences. He worked with David Kelly a lot. So Michael and I met. Michael said, look, I know who you are, but I don't know your work. Get, show, you know, send me your stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll get back to you. And he, you know, again, he was, I mean, he was lucky. He was a guy who was as good as his word. And he said, um, he looked at the films and he called and he said, yeah, look, you could do TV, no problem. So he said, look, I'm not running a show right now, but as soon as I, you know, hook up with another show, I'll call you and, and you right. know, you'll do it. And then, you know, like uh, six months later, he called me. And he said, look, it's not in the, you know, not in the trade papers yet, but um, David Kelly, you know, wants me to come back on Chicago Hope because mm -hmm. I, it, it, what it's in what it tur turned out to be its last year, but they didn't think it was going to be its last year at the time. <laughs> so he said, um, you know, I'll give you, you know, an episode. And it was great. It was a great way to start because he was able to help me mm -hmm. also, you know, in terms of there's like things that go on on the TV you know, when you're doing TV that you don't do in a feature, it's much, it's a little bit fast. I mean, I was working pretty fast, you know, um, but, but TV is even faster. Right. You know? um, so he, he was very helpful. And then the, it the, the episode that I did turned out well. So then I got into the David Kelly camp and then, you know, I just circulated through all the shows that he was doing at that time which were numerous, you know, he was doing, um, the practice, he was doing, um, what was the one with Callista Flockhart? Um, it's another legal show. Uh, not LA it? law. Is it not? Oh, no, not LA oh. law. It's, um, was it well, Janie? What was the show that Callista was in? Allie yeah. Allie McBeal. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I ended up doing those, did Ellie McBeal, did private practice, you know, just moving through all of those. And, and, you know, it just forces you to learn. It's like graduate school. Um, so I, I ended up, you know, we were living in Santa Monica and then, you know, and then Michael got hired to do the next year to do the guardian. So mm -hmm. he hired me to do the guardian. Uh, I did a few episodes of that, that year. And then I hit it off with David Hollander. And then when he did his next show, which was Heartland, which was about organ transplant, he asked me to run the show. You know, it'd be the, he was going to be the, he was the show runner, but I was going to run the production. Right. So I was hiring the directors and making sure, you know, just, you know, the schedules were working, you know, just kind of keeping, you know, he was in the writer's room all the time and I'm on the set or I'm in the office, but, um, and then, but that, David got more interested in, uh, you know, like th there's real drama with uh, organ transplant, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, most, most medical shows, if you think about it, 
even from the first, the, you know, the first medical show was a play on Broadway called Men in White. And it was, you know, about a hospital. Right. And all, all shows, even to today, are based on that. It's all about <laughs> the, the heroic doctor. You mm-hmm. know? Um, you know, and it's so now it's, you know, there's different, you know, men do it, women do it is, di- you know, it's diverse, you know, ethnically diverse now, but it's essentially the same thing. It's a heroic doctor, you know, right. even, let's say like house, he's got problems. He's, you know, he takes pills, he's, you know, he's addicted to pills, but he's a brilliant, you know, diagnostician. Right. And, um, you know, you love the guy or, you know, and, and he solves it. What David got interested in more was um, the the drama of the person who has to go to the usually the parents mm-hmm. on the worst day of their life when they just heard that their son or daughter has been killed in an accident, right? In a violent accident, and and they have to convince the parents to donate that person's organs. Mm. So it's very dramatic, but it's incredibly depressing. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so, um, so we, we only ran one season, and, mm. uh, but it, you know, it was fun to do. And, um, you know, everything, everything, I, I mean, I feel really lucky because everything I've done, I've learned from, and, you know, uh, I, I had, I had done, as I say, Chicago hope, but you know, then it like, then you do a medical show and then you go into medical shows, you do, a lawyer show, you go to lawyer shows. Um, right. And it, I was lucky that I could do, you know, different ones and, you know, they would hire me. And then eventually I got into doing, uh, on the guardian, there was one episode I did where there was a, a pretty horrendous car crash. And it was mm. the first time that I had done a, any stunt kind of stuff. Right. So, um, sort of in typical Hollywood fashion, I mean, I had been working, I think three or four years by that time in television. Mm -hmm. And I got called in by one of the executives at Fox. It was, you know, it was a Fox show and I had done a bunch of stuff for Fox. So he said to me, he goes, you know, and all the stuff I had done up till that point was, was character stuff, you know, it was comedies or, you know, medical, it was nothing to do with action. Right. But this guy really liked the car crash. And he, so he called me and he goes, you know, he goes, have you ever done character stuff? <laughs> You're a really good action director. Right. Done character stuff. And I'm looking, I'm going, man, this is like so Hollywood, you know? Mm-hmm. But then I got, you know, hired to do, you know, action shows, Jericho, um, the unit, you know, David Mamet's show, you know, about uh, Delta Force, which I didn't even think existed when they hired me to do, but it turns out it is real. Um <laughs> You know, and it was fun. I mean, action is fun to do. Right. You know, it's not that hard. It, it's just, it's fun. So you have all these people who do it. You know, they know how to do it. Mm-hmm. And I, I enjoyed it. You know, I mean, I would, it would scare me when stuff blew up. <laughs> and then I'd be the first person, you know, diving to the ground, even though, you know, it'd be 100 yards away or 200 yards away from a house that's blowing up. But oh anyway, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, TV was fun and I learned a lot. And then, you know, then I, after, then I got, uh, I don't know, then I, I, one of the, Mike Ostrowski, who's now one of the executive producers on The Witcher, Mm -hmm. it's an international show. um, He and I worked on a couple of TV series together. So uh, Michael, I approached Michael about trying to develop a a movie because I wanted to get back to features. Right. And, um, and I was uh, what I, I was interested, you know, it's just everything. The features I've done for the most part have been driven by the, you know, when you do TV, you just get hired and you do it, you know, you don't, uh, you know, whereas with features, I mean, apart from, you know, three out of the five that I've done, I mean, well, I've only done five, um, were independent, you know, where, where I, I came up with the idea and right. developed it over the years. And so this last fe- feature that I did was a picture called, all saints and it was I, I i just was interested in the world of um clergy you know uh because i had done some research and clergy have a real problem uh at home because they're 
not home as much. Mm-hmm. But also, they're on call, you know, kind of like old fashioned doctors. I mean, if you're, a, you know, let's say you're a clergy, you know, you're you're the pastor of a church and, uh, you know, some tragedy happens in your family. Right. You call your pastor and your pastor comes to your house, you know, or, in, you know, a rabbi, I mean, whatever, you know, you, you call that person and you expect that person to you know, guide you. So I, the research that I'd done, it was like, all there was this commonality that existed in, in clergy families where the children feel neglected. Right. And have problems, a lot of them. So I just was interested in exploring that world. So I approached Mike about it. Mike's father, uh, be- before he married his mother, was a, was a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. and and left the priesthood to marry his mother so you know mike had an interest in it um and he actually found the article for all saints it was was based on a on a article that was in the tennessean uh, incident that had happened in nashville right so he gave me the article i really liked it i thought it would be the good basis for a story and and then we started working on that and you know again most of the, the independent pictures that i've done have all taken like five years to get made, <laughs> but you know, but that you know, that time I had saved up enough money that I we could do it, you know. Right. So, uh, but I didn't. I didn't want to do any. I didn't. While I was trying to get All Saints made, I, I had pretty. I had stopped doing television, mm-hmm. and I stopped watching television because I wanted to get that out of my head, you know, because TV. There's a lot of close-ups and, you know, it was different now with, you know, streaming stuff and, and you know, like Game of Thrones was big. Right. I, you know, I was doing all broadcast stuff and my stuff, you know, it was everybody demanded a lot of close-ups, singles, you know, not my style of, but you have to do it. I mean, and you learn from it, you know? Right. But so with All Saints, I, I just wanted to clear my head. The only TV show I did while we were prepping all Saints was um, I did an episode of uh, Blue Bloods because um, Michael called. Michael was running that show at the time. Michael Preston, mm, right? And, and a director dropped out at the last minute, and Michael called and said, "Look, can you come to New York and and take over the show?" Um, so I, you know, with I, I, you know, can't turn Michael down. You know, I mean, you know. <laughs> so I said, "Yeah," you know. And I, so I did that, but, you know, as soon as that was over, it got right back to, you know, trying to get all saints. I mean, we finally got it made and, you know, that did well as, you know, that did okay. So, mm-hmm. uh, anyway, so that's, that kind of brings me up to date <laughs> in some way. Right. <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> what are you doing nowadays? Well, I, you know, it's funny when I finished all saints, um, I liked the way it turned out. I felt really comfortable on the set. You know, all that TV work really added up. And, and you know, I'd been working on it, so I was, like, very comfortable. And we mm-hmm. had a really good cast. It was John Corbett, um, uh, Barry Corbin. Um, oh, I love Barry Corbin. <laughs> uh, Barry Corbin's great. So, mm-hmm. you know, we had a good cast, solid cast. And um, I, I did – so, anyway, I didn't – I was tired, you know, I didn't want to get into, I didn't want to develop another feature at that time and know, okay, it's going to be another five years before I do it. Right. And I, you know, I've never really made plans. You know, the only time I've ever had plans, uh, you know, when you do TV, you kind of get, you make your schedule at the beginning of the year, generally, (laughs) you know, your, your agent books you on different shows and so you sort of know how it's going, you know, how the year is going to go. Um, but I, other than that, I never had plans for anything. It was always like, you know, I'll see what I'm interested in and what I want to do. Anyhow, I got invited back to the State University at Purchase to show All Saints. Okay. So I showed it. Um, you know, they showed it. And then there was a question and answer thing after. And, and then um, the president of the school and the guy who was the dean of uh, the School of the Arts um said you know can you know if you stay overnight we can um you know we'd like you to you know like 
you know, observe a couple of classes and, and have them talk to you, you know, ask questions and stuff. So I said, fine, you know, uh, and then they came up to me after that and they said, look, have you thought about teaching? Or they, well, I think they first said, what are your plans? And I said, <laughs> you know, I'm freelance. I never have plans. I don't know what I'm, I never know what I'm doing. Right. But they, they said, well, how do you feel about teaching? You know, do you want to teach? So I had said, you know, it's funny, I've never given it thought, but, um, you know, my life was changed by a teacher. So, yeah, I, I would. Yes, I would. Right. And so they said, look, you develop the courses you want and and we'll do them. So, I, you know, I so the past, you know, three years, I think I've been doing um, I've been teaching at Purchase. Uh, I do I do a scene study class that's called Creative Collaboration for Actors and Directors, because what I found working on television was that a lot of directors who are doing that work are, don't really know how to work with actors. They're sort of afraid of actors. A lot of guys coming out of, men and women coming out of um, film school. You know, film school doesn't really concentrate on working with actors. It's more about the camera, the you know, lighting, that stuff. And right. Then, so um, I said, I think directors need more contact with actors. And so they said they agreed. So we did. We've been doing that class, and um, and then theater games, which was like the first class I took. Uh, so doing that, and then the guy who was the dean at the time, he went down to Van. He became a dean at Vanderbilt. He's the dean. His guy's name is Frank Candelaria, mm -hmm. and he's at. Um, he he's the dean of the Blair School of Music at at uh, Vanderbilt, and he's really, really interested in diversity and how diversity works. Like when he was at Purchase, he kind of, uh, he, he almost was like a, a college football coach in terms of recruiting. He, he would call <laughs> principals in, you know, the South Bronx and in uh, Brooklyn, you know, and, and talk to principals about, do you have any kids who you think are, you know, who could go to college, but they don't, maybe they don't think they're, you know, ready, or maybe their parents don't want them to, or, you know, it's just not in their, you know, they're like first generation kids, maybe, you know, and, and then he would go on his weekends and he would go to these kids' houses and right. talk to the parents and talk to the kids about coming to purchase. And he was really successful. And so like my classes now, I would say have all been uh, at least 50% and usually 60% uh, Latino, black, first generation. I mean, it's very, it's so much more diverse than when I was there, when, right. I, when I went to school at Purchase. Because when I was at Purchase, it was all white. Mm -hmm. And so so now that he's at Blair, he, he, got, he just got a big uh, grant to do a, a scholarship program, which will give... Uh, full scholarships to first generation kids in their family who ha who where they're the first ones in their families to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's got money to give them a full scholarship, to pay room and board, to give them a stipend, to give their families a stipend, right. and to have to hire a full time advisor. So he got another grant to do a documentary about it. He wants to make a feature documentary. Hmm. And so, um, you know, he, he, you know, he, he flew me down to uh, Nashville to meet with him and to talk about it. And so we talked about it and, and he said, you know, I'd really like you to do it. Right. So I'm good. That's so that project is, we, we the, I think the first shooting days will be in um, April or May. And then next year we go full time at at Vanderbilt. Right. And we'll go. You know, we'll visit the kids who get the scholarship at their homes to see them in context, talk to their parents, see their families, what their you know what their neighborhoods are like, uh, and then um, you know, and then just kind of follow them. You know, every five or six weeks. You know, but I also want to give them cameras. You know, give them iPhones now. You know, which shoot really good stuff. And, and have them, you know, to do like a, a, a video diary, you know, right. what they're going through. Because Vanderbilt is, is a very white campus. <laughs> and so these kids who will be coming in, it's, and it's a very wealthy campus, you know, um, 
I mean, I lived in Nashville for three years and I, we lived just up the street from Vanderbilt. So, right. I, I, you know, I walked through that campus pretty often and um, it was very white and very wealthy, very, you know, very entitled. Mm -hmm. And the kids that Frank wants to bring in um, are all, you know, not entitled. You know, I mean, whether they're white or black or Latino or whatever, uh, they're all, you know, don't have they don't have money. Right. And he wants to bring those kids in and, you know, kind of give them, you know, an opportunity. You know, musicians, they have to be really good musicians to go to Blair. It's a very good school. Right. So. Um, so anyway, so we're just working out all the but the money the, the the great thing about doing this documentary is that, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. And I think it's an important issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that I've always cared about. Right. Um, but the other thing that's great is that the money's all in place. You know, and he said, how much money do you think you'll need for this? And I told him and he said, OK, it was like, OK, right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'll take a camera, too, you know, who was that? I was joking. I said, I'll take my camera over here. <laughs> great. Well, come down. It'll be great, Matt. Have a good time. <laughs> that's the other thing. Look, when I'm working, I'm like, for instance, I just consulted on a thing that uh, a friend of a friend is doing in Newark. Mm -hmm. with again kids who are all you know it's all latino and black mm -hmm. and but these kids have have volunteered for this program and it's a um it's like a drug intervention program but peer to peer right you know? so it, the focus this this year is on fentanyl you know because a lot of kids are dying from fentanyl you know yeah they think they're taking something else and it's fentanyl so it's pretty horrible. I mean, you know, this guy gave me a bunch of stuff to read and it's frightening what's happening. So they, they developed a script and he wanted to shoot to do a PSA. So I, I volunteered, you know, he asked me if I would do it. And, I, you know, so I've gone, you know, like a three, I think three days now, because these kids are not interested in filmmaking or theater. I mean, you know, they're all they, they're all going to college, but they you know, one kid wants to be a psychologist. Another kid wants to be a chemical engineer. You know, they're really interesting kids. Hmm. Um, but, you know, since they don't know anything about filmmaking, it was really starting from scratch. <laughs> and I didn't want to, you know, I, it's their project. So I didn't want to take over, you know, so I'm just there. And, and it was great. I, you know, really hit it off with the kids. We had a great time. I mean, my right. attitude is this. I mean, you know this, Matt. This business is hard. So when yes. you finally get the job. Right. You finally get hired to do something. You're mm -hmm. allowed to do it. Have a good time. You know, it should be joyful. It should be life affirming. Right. And so I'm, I really go out of my way to, to, you know, not only me, but the crew, the, you know, the, I want people to have a good time on, when I'm, you know, the, when I'm shooting. And so right. that's what I was trying to convey to them is that it doesn't have to be all, you know, tense and stuff you don't have to blow up in anybody nobody yells you know it's all let's all work together let's collaborate figure out how to do this right so i was doing that and, you know that was you know good but anyway so i'm teaching right now but uh you know at the end of the semester we start the documentary okay yeah what kind of music do you like oh wow uh god i like I don't, I wouldn't say, I mean, you know, I think like a lot of people who, you know, grew up in the sixties and seventies, you usually like the first music you sort of get into is kind of the music that stays with you. Right. So, you know, I mean, I'm a really big fan of, um, you know, Phil Oaks, Bob Dylan, um, Crosby, Stills, Nash, uh, you he know, just that, too. yeah, yeah. Uh, the Ronstadt, you know, I mean, th those are the people who sort of, when I first started listening to music, it was th their music, you know, so th that stuff stays with me. Right. I really, I like jazz very much. Um, I like classical. Um, I, I like, you know, I, I still have to be schooled in hip hop, but I, but I really like it. I mean, I, you know, I'm not one of those people who's like, what, this isn't music. You know, I mean, there, it's, it's very it's pretty sophisticated music, frankly, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so those are, the, I kind of jump around, but, but you know, I, just all over the place, really. Not, not any specific, you know, form. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty open about it. Right. 
Yeah, I'm kind of the same way too. I mean, it, I'm I'm old school, you know. Yeah. So it, but with me, it depends on you know with with me. I don't know a lot of today's generational stuff because I know hip hop and rap is kind of taking over. I mean, I you know I'm I'm into yeah. it a, a bit because I grew up with the Tupac and Biggie and all that. But right. Right. you know, um, I'm more old school. You know, I just I literally just saw uh, a doc on the Mamas and the Papas. So I started oh, yeah. getting into I started getting into their music. I mean, the one. The one guy, uh, Denny, I knew of because he was in the kids' show Theodore Tugboat. He was the narrator on that, so I didn't even know. Like, yeah. he was in the Mamas and the Papas, okay. Wow. So I know about Mama Cassidy and and, yeah. and Michelle Phillips and all of them. You know, it's uh, I'm into that and uh, wow, really? Yeah, I'm old school, man. I'm a big <laughs> Hall of Notes geek uh, and Michael McDonald. <laughs> and when when the Temptations movie came out. I got hooked into Motown and yeah. I like jazz. I'm 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 really old school. And you know, now because I'm a delivery driver, it's like, you know, I burn CDs. So like whatever I meant to or here on the radio, I burn it and play my truck when I'm on the road. So that's great. Yeah. So great. You know, it's funny when you say Motown, I mean, because in high school, uh the parties we had, that that's what was played mostly. <laughs> the four tops, the temps. Um, I mean, all Motown. I mean, it was pretty much I would say. At our parties, I mean, because we're talking in the like, well, late sixties, um, you know, it was Motown. So whenever I hear, you know, any of that stuff from then, I just think back to, you know, high school and these, you know, because the, the, you know, there was you could dance to it, you know, so it was like, and you could slow dance to some stuff. Oh yeah, that's what we wanted to do, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So I, I, I yeah, but I, I'm I'm pretty much all over the place, like you. Mm -hmm. you left you know you you know like i said you know they should do a doc about you you left quite a legacy you know i mean even 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 with the barney movie i mean <laughs> kids love that movie still so it's no, like you know, you it is funny i mean it's funny you say that because um how many t well three three kids now have come up to me just in the past year at, at purchase and have come to me with like VHS copies of Barney. <laughs> and they ask me to sign it. Right. They, you know, the thing, oh, that's what, you know, with Barney, my attitude was, um, this is going to be the first movie that a lot of kids see. Right. So I felt like an obligation that I said, so we have to do a great job on this. You know, we can't. You know, it's kind of like those critics were saying, well, it's better than it needs to be. It was like, well, no, I mean, I, I dealt with it like it was a real movie, you know, and I wanted it to be, you know, fantasy. And now, you know, and that there's that scene in the that strange lady's house like that. You know, it's like a you know, we had some big stuff in there. <laughs> and, uh, like, you know, so so it's it was it's really it's kind of rewarding in a way. These kids coming up to me and, you know, I mean. I don't know. You know, I, 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 I'm, it's just, it's nice. It's just nice. It's you super know? duper. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad know? you liked it. So. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I did. You know, I, I remember watching you know little promo trailers for it, and um, uh -huh. uh, I think a few years ago I found out that uh, Kyla Platt was in the movie. I had no idea that she was in that. She was the the friend in the movie, Kyla Pratt. She yeah. yeah. Kyla she, she I had no her. idea that was her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, I think she probably though she had a pretty good career, right? She is she still working? Yeah, she's still, she still working. So that's good, good for her. Because a lot of kid actors, you know, once they become adults, you're like a different person. You know, you're not yeah. the same person, right? Um, Trevor, you know, who played the boy, mm -hmm. he he was working for a while. And the third girl, Diana, um, she was sort of the sort of, um, I, I don't know, she had the best perspective, I would say, on her life. You know? Right. And so when she became an adult, she stopped acting. Yeah. You know, and I don't know what she's doing now. We were in touch for a little while, but. I mean, I'm sure she's, you know, like doing a regular job now, which is good. Right. You know, it's it's tough for kid actors. They're very tough. You it's know, a lot of pressure. 
You know, I, I always, for the movie, I always, you know, because I had Barney dolls and toy merchandises, and I will always copy that scene in the movie. I would put him in the tub, and I thought I would flip the curtain off, and he would be real. I always would do that, because I was just so into Barney at that time. But my favorite, I, I love every scene in that movie, but my favorite was the scene where, <laughs> I forget where where he was at, but it, it was at the woman's house with all the books, and the cameras were scrolling. I was yeah. like, that's a big freaking house. All these books all over the place. That's like, a geez. cool scene, though. I, I love that scene. Yeah. I mean, watching it, I, I look at it go, you know, I would love to direct a scene like that. Like, they're in this big house, these big freaking ladders, like an actual library, and you're shooting all these pans of yeah. all these books all over. <laughs> because I think it spun, didn't it? The yeah, the camera spun. Yeah. So that was yeah. I I I really dug doing that scene. That was the only scene, by the way, that we did, you know, on a soundstage. You okay. know, built the set and did it. everything else was location work. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, that but that is a really cool scene. I mean, so I felt like an obligation. You know, I felt like, look, this is going to be the first movie these kids see. So we got to, you know, we had. I mean, I remember at the production meeting. That's what I said to everybody. I said, look. No matter what you think about Barney, you know, <laughs> uh, we we have to do, you know deliver something you know that's really good for these kids because it's you know as I say it's going to be their first picture so right let's really go out you know do it and um, and we did you know I mean you, I, I you know I'm I'm proud of that picture yeah I mean you you did a good job directing and Charlize really did, yeah. did a, you know it was her baby so she she did oh, a yeah. great job on it as well oh, she's a yeah. Well, it was great also that she was like, you know, kind of uh, free enough to, to, you know, if I made a suggestion, I mean, she didn't just automatically do it, but she, you know, understood that it was different than the TV show. Right. And that we had to do some things differently. So I, I give her a lot of credit. I mean, she was really good to work with. Right. You know, and we had a great, I mean, the, the, the crew was just wonderful on that. You know, and it, also they drink wine at lunch, so... <laughs> This was, that was good too. <laughs> I hear you, man. Are you more like a BJ or a baby bop? I know they was in the movie as well. I made mean, came in your appearance. <laughs> I don't know, you know. Um, no, but it would be it was odd sometimes because you know there's little people in those. Yeah. Know? And so we had. Um, and and then we had to have, for the most part, we had little people as stand-ins for the kids. Mm -hmm. So there would be days when there'd be whole whole families of little people, like you know, just sitting off the set. And then there'd be all these circus people doing, you know, like you know, stretching or doing, you know, bouncing on a trampoline. I mean, so. Whenever you know, I'd be setting up a shot. If I looked around, it would be the strangest community of people, right? You know, but it was great, really fun, and it was great to get to know all those people, you know. Right. So, but I have no specific feeling for either Baby Pop <laughs> or, or BJ. <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, I, I I thank you for what you what all you did for that project, and uh, you mm -hmm. know, like you said, no matter what people thought about the show, which is. Surreal. I, I had to thank my mother recently after watching the doc for um, not telling me about the haters because I didn't know. Oh, like, didn't it was know. so much. I, I had no idea how surreal it was because even yeah. she told me even then people would ask her about it and be like, it's just another kid's show. And I didn't know until seeing the doc about how surreal people just yeah didn't like no. it. I'm just like another kid's show. <laughs> it was so freaky to me. Yeah. And right. The fact that they had those like bonfires on college campuses. I was like, <laughs> come on. You know, it's it's not hurting anybody. What are right. You <laughs> He's just a happy dinosaur. Come on. He's, that's it. He's just a happy dinosaur. Right. So it's great. It's great. Well, well, well thank you. It's been fun. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you, Steve, for um, coming on today. I appreciate Thanks it. For inviting me. No yeah. problem. I, I appreciate it. I, I know the fans have appreciated it as well. Um, Thank you. Uh, just stay put. I'll be right with you in one second. I'm going to close okay. this baby up. Great. Well, guys, thanks for tuning in today for another day with PE Slick Podcast or Slick. I bet you I know I got two names. Uh, 
I got uh, another guest that's going to be joining me real soon, who's a book author as well, who's going to speak about how his life changed and how he's been reaching people. So stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for more. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, this has been great. Oh, somebody left a... Oh, somebody said thank you. Thanks for watching. <laughs> so thanks for tuning in today. And uh, I'm going to try my best to do it. And remember, I love you. <laughs> I'm not Bob West, but that, I tried. <laughs> Until next time, y'all be safe. Thank you.